Welcome to Camera Ready and Able, the podcast that explores the intersection of media change and personal growth. I'm your host, Barbara Barna Abel, and my calling is to help you tap into your superpowers to thrive on camera and in life, and to make an impact on the world. This episode is brought to you by the word determination, which means the act of deciding definitively and with firm purpose, as well as resolute, one of my favorite words, which is defined as admirably purposeful, determined, and unwavering. Flora describes determination as a mindset, not a behavior. Here to discuss is Shannon O'Dowd, who is uniquely positioned to share her insights because Shannon works in every aspect of the camera ready universe. She works as a corporate media trainer and strategist, as an on-camera spokesperson and host, as a talent agent with Taylor Talent Services. Shannon is also an author and the CEO of Shannon O'Dowd Presents. So Shannon's clients have appeared on The Today Show, Entertainment Tonight, HGTV, Hallmark, and QVC, as well as major market morning shows as talent herself. Shannon has done campaigns for Wayfair, Cable One, Sunsweet Raisins, Office Max, QVC, and Curd, to name but a few. And as an agent, Shannon knows how deals get done and where the market is right now. I am so happy to have this conversation. Welcome to the podcast, Shannon. Thank you so much, Barbara. I'm so happy to be here. Yay. So how did you pick the word determination? Well, I I was really down between two words. Uh, There's so many great words, but I was, I was thinking tenacious. I love that word. I love love that word too. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of overlap in the Venn diagram between determination and tenacity. So I kind of, I put them both there um, because I think that's, that's, that's really at the root of it is the determination is waking up every day and knowing what you want to do and doing everything within your power to make that dream happen. Yeah. I love that. That's why I'm adding the word resolute to that, to the, uh, I do. I love resolute. So walk me through too, how, um, you know, this applies in your own life. Well, I think as an early 20s person who moved here from Florida to be an actress. Um, I stayed in the game a lot longer than other people that started with me (laughs) at the starting line. And I do think um, that's because of my sheer tenacity, determination. I was, I was resolute, if you will, that what I wanted as my dream needed to happen. And I just needed to figure out the right formula, meet the right person and walk through the right doors. So um, I definitely think that that has played into my life. Um, You know, as we talked about a little bit earlier, like I've also had to evolve. Uh, So, you know, when I saw, oh, there's a lot of clearing on this path and a lot of energy heading in this direction, it wasn't my original direction. You know, I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be on a procedural. That was my dream. But then the first time I hosted, I was like, oh, hold the phone. This is where it's at. And all of those years of training and thinking I wanted to be an actress has led me to this point so that I could discover hosting. And this is actually my calling. But I had to be flexible for that. Right? So I do think that it's definitely played a role in my life. Were you always a determined kid? Yes, I was always mm-hmm. incredibly to a fault. Mm-hmm. Maybe. <laughs> I was always pushing my way to the front, you know, in all the plays. And uh, yeah, yeah, I was uh, very precocious, but uh, I knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted. And I wanted to be, I wanted to be an actor since I could breathe. I was doing community theater when I was five. So that's kind of always what I wanted. To me, that is such a gift to know what you want at a young age. I mean, many of us can struggle, you know, well into adulthood and, you know, still looking for that thing. I think that's actually a wonderful present in your life. But I also love, you know, what you just described because the way that you pivoted and adjusted and you fell into something else that you discovered that you loved when you started TV hosting, whether you had the language for it, you know, when you were at that age or not, was I think you were determined to succeed. I was I was really determined to be an artist and I wanted that to look like performance. Yes, and I was determined to succeed at being a performer and I was also willing to pivot when I was like I am never going to be Meryl Streep. 
But I remember saying to myself, I could be the Meryl Streep of hosting. And I was like, now that sounds like something to pursue. So, so how did you have that conversation with yourself? Oh, I have big, conversations with myself all the time. <laughs> well, I love that as one should, but I meant like, that's a very serious conversation when we have the realization that um, for good and for bad, that I mean, and that I also love that you chose Meryl Streep because then we can get deep into like, well, what does that mean? And redefining success. And like, is that the only way? So with that, so what one, I was curious, like at what point, like what triggers that you actually have such an honest conversation with yourself? Because many of us have a hard time having those honest conversations. And two, when you said that, what did that really mean? Like, you know, when you stand and have perspective now, because you might be having these conversations with your clients in, you know, today about like, well, when you're saying I'm never going to be the Meryl Streep, one, you can't be because there's only one Meryl, but two, so what does that actually translate to? It, it translates to a goat, the greatest of all time. Got it. That's what I, you know, I, when I, okay. So when I was, I was actually on the first scripted medical drama. It was the first scripted show in TLC history. They had only done, they had only done reality up until that point. And, uh, and then the writer strike happened and I had a friend who directed commercials and he was like, you should try hosting. And I was like, what is that? Like, that's what you do. That's the person that seats you at the restaurant. Like, I <laughs> and he's like, we'll go get a videographer. I'll take you out. We'll do a hosting reel. And we did. And he, we wrote some copy really quickly. And then pretty soon after that, I got the audition, an audition for Sun Sweet Raisins. And I was supposed to just taste some raisins. And they said, you look like what we're trying to find for the spokesperson. Will you read this? And I was terrified, um, but I ended up getting that job. And all of a sudden I was like, wait, I don't have to do any character research. I don't have to do any substitution. I don't have to worry if I'm honoring the character enough or if I'm understanding the backstory. I just get to stand here and be myself. Like this is the best thing since sliced bread, you know? And I think it like alleviated so much of that imposter syndrome I had as an actor because I just Ooh. could be myself. Oh, wow. You know, I believe that um, acting training is so helpful in the hosting space, as well as I actually think that host training is very helpful in the acting space, which is um, not always a popular opinion. So now just as we talk about it, um, in that revelation, what do you think some of those transferable skills were in terms of like the training, all that training you had as a performer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um and I have seen it be really helpful. I've also seen it kind of hurt a little sometimes mm -hmm. too. Try to bring a character to hosting. And sometimes there is a version of a character, but a lot of times it's it's only a few degrees from your natural self who you are in the world. Um, but the ability to command my space, mm -hmm. you know, the, the ab ability to um, communicate a message. And I would honestly say there's been a lot of products that I've represented that but that acting has really helped me look like it's the best thing in the world. So I think in, in terms of the degree of excitement about something that I might not necessarily be that excited about, it is very much, you know, like. Because you knew how to tap into yourself. That's a, that's a connected, interconnectedness. Yeah. That's very important. Acting, I love because it teaches you so much about breathing and connecting to yourself and different aspects that um, are so important actually to me in hosting, but are not necessarily what we teach in, um, you know, sort of intro hosting classes and a lot of stuff where it's a lot more about hosting technique and not that who you are and how do you yeah. feel and how do I relate to that? And sometimes I've actually said to people, it's relevant too when you have to understand motivation and where we are in a script. It's like, what's just happened? What's happening next? Because sometimes when you're, you know, doing whether it's the voiceover or narration in a show, or even understanding the difference between an intro and um, a tease, and when you're throwing to commercial and coming back or the close of the show. And acting training has taught you to ask, ask yourself those questions, as opposed that's to just look point. at the, the copy as words on a page or a screen at this point. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you're really taught to, to think about what the writer intended as an actor. And I'm constantly telling my hosts, like the writer used this word. Why would he use this word out of all of the words? Like, what is the intention? Like, who is your audience? Who do you need to be to be a representation of that audience? And I do think that as actors, we are 
trained to to get in the seat and in the headspace of the of the writer and see what the intention was. You know, as we're talking, it's just dawning on me, which is obvious because I said it in my intro, you have such a unique perspective. So walk me through too how this informs, you know, your approach or methodology to media training and host training, because you're literally on all sides of this. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, well, you know, I started out as a as a hosting coach. I worked for Suzanne Senna for mm -hmm. many years and taught her level one class, and that was so incredible. Um, and then from there, I started, you know, teaching on my own, um, which morphed into media training. Like they, there's, you know, so yep. much. Know how that goes. So <laughs> laugh there. Yeah, you know, you know, you know. Um, and you know, I. For some reason, when we're staring into an inanimate object, a lot of us become some other version of ourselves that is inauthentic and disconnected. And I don't know why. Um, it was not a problem that I had, right? So that, you know, but it's the reason why I have a job. That, that's why I always say, like, I don't know why this freaks people out to stare into a camera, but it does. And it makes people weird to the point. And I'm using weird very loosely. I mean, inauthentic, not the natural self they are in the world that, you know, that's your, that's my only job. It's like, I just want the you that's quirky and weird and whatever that is. Like, let's get away. Let's get rid of anything distracting from your message. But beyond that, like, who are you in the world? And let's get you to be that person in front of the camera. What do you think is the biggest stumbling block besides the fear of that little red dot? Um, I, I, I think it's mostly the fear of the red dot. I think it's, you know, as, um, as a species, we're a pack species and it's threatening when we step outside of our pack and we turn to our pack and we set ourselves up to be ridiculed. You know, that's why public speaking is next to death with fear, you know? So to, Put yourself out there to be judged and ridiculed, like make some really strange things happen to people. It's absolutely true. And one of the reasons why I wanted to almost belabor the point is because sometimes I think on the executive side, if you've never done it, you can't understand how somebody who seems so normal and rational to work with, especially if you're taking someone who's an expert in their field and putting them camera and, and wondering like, why did they turn into somebody else? And it's like, because it is such a vulnerable thing to do. What I really care about for the audience is where we are now and where the opportunities are and how does now determination, you know, play into the circling back to our word and the advice that you would give to people. Yeah. And um, so I've been an agent for four years now and um, I am with Taylor Talent Services that you mentioned. And I know you've spoken to, well, you know, Blair. Blair but was a wonderful guest. Gosh. Podcast. Oh my gosh. Love, I know. love, love. So much fun. And I think for me, like as a coach, you know, I could get people ready for the opportunities that they'd already been presented to them. I could, you know, get them ready for an audition. I could get them ready just in general in case an opportunity came up, but I couldn't personally move them down the field in any way. And that was really limiting, especially in, and frustrating, especially for some of my people who I'm like, this person is a star. And I'm sure you've come across this people too in your your training, you know, and I was like, I want the ability to really move people down the field and to really help in a new way. Um, so that's really what being an agent has given me. Um, you know, a lot of my clients as an agent, they will send me their tapes and I, you know, will redirect them in that way too. Um, but it's just a whole new level of being to help, being able to help people to call them when they book something, to hear the joy on the other end. So it's really gratifying and in a whole new way. Blair said the same thing. That's the best is being able to call with the, with the news. And I love the way you frame that about taking people down the field. I, yeah. I love the image of that and your commitment and your passion to that. So, but so here we are, but it's a very different playing field if we're going to stretch your metaphor than it was. And so, you know, that's what I'm asking. So the advice you might give to somebody because determination is required, but, but how, because somebody, you know, what does that really translate to? Is that meaning years, technique, um, practice, um, Blair did a really great job of opening up about, you know, shifting your definition of what the work is. That's a great way of putting it. 
Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, you know, for example, I have one client who, you know, has done contracts with, you know, Yahoo and Verizon and done contracts for all these like digital platforms. And she won't do linear TV because the pay isn't as good. And she's a, she's a chef and on Instagram and TikTok with a huge following. And that is such a microcosm of what the industry is becoming. Like, you know, back in my day, that's all you wanted was the Food Network. That was all you wanted was something that was on broadcast, something that was on linear TV. And it's just morphing to the point that like, that's just not, that's just not the climate anymore. That's just not the reality anymore. So you just have to be so, in, you have to investigate so much constantly. What is the current marketplace? What are the trends? Where am I being hired? Right? Like as a 40 something white woman, like I used to do a ton of commercials. That is not the current climate. And it's great for LGBTQ plus, it's great for, you know, biracial indigenous people of color. Like this is an amazing pendulum swing, swing, mm -hmm. pendulum swing, easy for me to say, <laughs> but I have to also recognize like that I am not having a moment. So where, where are those people being hired? Right. So you have to be very investigative um, in order to roll this. Cause this is like the wild, wild west. Like we're like, like we're really figuring it out, like with the social media and all the digital platforms and TV is going to be obsolete. Like, you know, it's a very interesting time. So I love the example of the chef who doesn't want to be on linear TV. I've worked with many digital people because they own everything who don't want to be on TV. Cause it's like, why would I give up any ownership or to your point, the money It's like, I'm a biz, I'm running a business. So I will be in business with people, but I'm not going to be an employee or a, so it's a whole different mindset around that. And I remember the first time having a conversation with a network executive, gosh, going back 15 years, and he was shocked going, wait, how could they say no? And I had to so gently say, you know what? They make more than you. I know you're the president of the network, but they own it all. They're like seriously way in the seven figure club. And that's not whatever, where everybody is. But so there's that side of it. But why I'm bringing the possibility is there for sure. Absolutely. Um, and so the other, the, moving on with this, I was going to say, so it's just for people to check in with themselves. And what does that mean? Because by the way, you can put anything on your smart TV at this point, and then you could be quote unquote on TV. So it's like, we have to change up because I think people are attaching that to like, how am I watching this? And is that legitimate or not? But I remember doing a workshop and how many people came in with, it was a pitching workshop, like how to pitch. And they had all these ideas for cable. And I said, can I get a show of hands? How many here people actually um, have a cable subscription? You know, and it's like very few. And I said, look, okay, hey guys, you know, I'm the oldest one in the room. I'm going down with the cable ship. I love my New York one and we love our ESPN. So, you know, and we're not going to yeah. bundle yet, but with this, we're starting thinking things anyway, but you know what I'm saying? I was like, why are you pitching ideas for something that you don't watch or interact with? You know why? Because it's imprinted in your brain that somehow that's validating her has more value. And so yeah. I love what you just said. Yes. No, I mean, you know, like I'm thinking like in the DIY space, you know, my interior designer clients, they have brand deals with like amazing big brands and then they want to show on HGTV or the DIY network or, you know, design network. And I'm like, you, you, you know that you're going to get paid a thousand dollars a week to shoot this, like, especially on your first show. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah. That's what it is. You know, you're going to be shooting all day for a whole week. You'll probably make a thousand dollars. Like, and they're just like, but I just got $22,000 to, you know, do a couple of videos for this paint company. I'm like, yep. I don't know what to tell you. Well, you just told us and thank you for that. No, in no, the best way. So wait, so now I, ask, I want to ask the question, what do brands really look for right now? Because, um, that's constantly evolving. And so I'm just curious, like the value of a micro influencer, because I think it, some people get stuck in their tracks going, but I don't have a million followers. Does a million followers still matter? Is it much more oh. about engagement? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, the the micro influencer is, I I think, still being targeted and has been for the last couple of years. So, you know, you need to be above 10k to even have the conversation. But there's lots of people that are in the 50 to 75,000 follower range that are getting seven to fifteen thousand dollars for a campaign of a couple of posts, you know, a video, like very manageable stuff with huge brands. Right. So I guess if I was to really, I would say 10 to 100,000, that's really where a lot of brands are going because they can afford those people. They're actually going to engage and respond to every single person that comments. Right. Like their engagement is going to be way more than, you know, a Jenner or a Kardashian. Right. So it's smarter to put your dollars there than, you know, some paint commercial on linear TV. Like it just is starting to make more sense. Circling back, how does determination play into this for your clients? Oh, my goodness. Like, do you have a determination well, I, scale? Can you sit, you know what I mean? When you're meeting with people, can you actually yes. kind of size up and go, you know what? This person does not have the determination. I mean, Blair is, as a coach, as a coach, I try to meet people where they are. Of course. Right? As a coach. You know, and I, I've, I've added my life coaching certification. It's very vulnerable to be in this space. It's very vulnerable to put yourself out there. We've got body dysmorphia and you name it. I've heard it. It's a very sensitive space. And everybody has a different level of being engaged and ready. But as an agent, Blair will really grill people. And I'm sitting there like wanting to hide under the table. But, you know, as an agent, we work for free for you. Right. So he's really good about grilling people to make sure that they're holding up their end of the bargain and they're coming into the relationship with as much to offer as we do. Right. And that means what are you doing every day for your career? What have you been doing for the last couple of years? What relationships with casting directors do you have? Like, what are you bringing to the table? Right. And he sniffs out those people that were like, well, it was COVID. And so I haven't really been in class in a couple of years. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Right. And all those things could be very true, but there's always a way to hustle and try to move yourself down the field. Oh, that's beautiful. And it just popped into my head, too. You know, actually, even wanting to hear somebody say, I am determined to you know, meet these goals in 2024, or um, I am determined to make a living in the space. That's actually great language to use for anybody who's writing out their goals or trying to There's manifest. So that's, a, that's a great word to use. I am determined to do this. And by the way, congratulations on getting your coaching certification. I'm a big believer. My life coaching. Yeah. yeah you know, it, it, there was so much sensitive stuff that people were bringing to me. And I, um, I just was like, you know what, I should actually have some actual training on, I know how to get, I know how to train people on camera. I know how to read people. Um, but when, when they come to me with, you know, some pretty gnarly stuff that's in their way, I just, I, I wanted to be able to handle that appropriately. Yeah. I had the exact same experience because I got to the place where I could identify the limitations and the blocks, but I didn't feel qualified to help people work through them. And then I was referring people to other people and I had clients say to me, but I trust you and I want to work with you. I don't want to go talk to somebody else. And I was like, ding, 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 ding. And so it is. And so I love having this conversation to explain to people because it's not, this is where the strategy and the mindset come in and why determination as a mindset was very appealing to me even in the, in the definition of the word, because it's this, you have to have the strategy and the mindset that goes with your technique and the practice to actually succeed in the space or um, any space. So that's an important part of the conversation and that the modalities intersect. But the other thing too, and I'm so I just want to throw this out because I think this is also where Blair is coming from is coachability, which is um, an openness to feedback. And so after many years as a coach, you come to realize um, two is the determination is, you know, working with the coaches, you need to work with people who are coachable. So I'm throwing that out to the audience to understand. It's like, so I applaud yay one for showing up and I'm definitely, I want coaching, but you have to do the work. And if you're not willing to do the work, it's not worth my time, but also you're not going to get anywhere. So I have a couple things I want to say about that. So, you know, 
hitting on determination, I've always told people, if you wake up in the morning and there is anything else that you want to do for a living, you should go do that. Because being a performer and earning a living is one of the most challenging things you can do, right? You have to love this over anything else, right? Like that truly has to be it. The second thing is to your point about coachability, coachability is everything. You're always going to be working with a team and you're going to be responsible for executing their vision, right? So if you're not malleable, if you're not willing to adjust even like micro amounts for a director, this is a collaborative effort. As much as it looks like you're the only person operating because you're the only one on camera. There's so many other people who have gotten you to this point and are part of that vision. I remember when I first met my husband, who was a fabulous host, he would get offended if he was redirected in an audition. He would take it as an affront that he had not brought something good into the room. And I said, the absolute opposite is true. They see something in you and they're trying to see if you're directable. And they're trying to see if they can, if you can move that needle. And like, that was, that was a real aha moment for him because once he shifted that and started to see it as a compliment, he started booking like crazy. And it truly is a compliment. Oh my gosh. I, I love you for saying that because in any other field, it almost would not even be a question, obviously. Right. I say this all the time. Athletes get the greatest athletes, the goats get coached forever. And they're constantly looking at ways to improve and adjust, right? Great actors work with their acting coaches forever. Um, you know, singers work with uh, vocal technique and on and on and on. Every great CEO has a private coach they work with for, you know, because it's all about if I'm here, how do I get to the next place? And, um, but in the hosting in this, in this part of communicating, because we mistake it with the idea that we're talking and, and instead of understanding that we're communicating. So we think that it, talking is easy. And if somebody's giving me notes on my talking, it, it, we take it personally. So everybody has to learn. Yeah, right. It's about learning go and resistance. And I actually think it circles back to such a great example with your influencer clients or your expert clients who are having brand deals, because that's such a good example where you have to take your brand and your awesome that they love but also make it somehow work with their brand. And that's totally. a perfectly good example of, of that kind of being open and malleable and, you know, seeing how we're in alignment and, you know. Um, yeah, every, every brand, every show has an identity, has a flavor, and maybe they want it a, just a slightly more buttoned up version of you or a slightly more conversational version of you or, you know, a version that's a little hipper or looser. And there's just all these, you know, things that we can do in our tool belt that are still versions of us, but are more in alignment with the general vision. Right. And that's really how you're collaborative. Gosh, that could have been another word we'd use collaborative. That is yeah. so important. Um, do you have any like, you know, sort of tips? Cause I mean, it is something and I do believe you can teach or I don't know if it's teach, but sometimes we have to point out to people what that means. So I don't know if that's come up for you in your career or especially as an agent, like to walk somebody through what that means to be collaborative, you know, on a set in the hosting space. Um, not so much as an agent, because really as an agent, if you're, if you don't have all that stuff dialed in, if you don't have, you know, a list of credits, a great reel, you know, if you're, if that train isn't already moving, we probably don't want to jump on board. Right. So, and, and we are trying to smell out or sniff out if you're going to be trouble, right? <laughs> like, you know, cause we're again, working for free, but usually, you know, there's so much evidence that there's working relationships, that there's credits that like, okay, this is a safe, this is a safe relationship to enter into. Right. I'm so um, glad we're having this conversation because again, I don't know that everybody's listening understands like that is some, that's a core thing that the gatekeeper and the people who are going to hire you or the people that are rec going to represent you are looking for when, if you want to sign with an agent or get hired, are you that's collaborative? A great word, Barbara. That's a great word. We are the gatekeeper and we take that role very seriously. We are the ones that are responsible for sending amazing casting directors like yourself, great people who are not going to cause you problems, right? Like we are that filter. 
And we, that's part of our job is to, to suss out the people who are really great, hard workers, very talented, and are going to do that job and be collaborative. Wait, and maybe can we pause for one sec to point out, I, you, again, I love how you've just said everything so beautifully and better than I could. But I want to point out too for the audience, for everyone who has a public persona as being difficult, but they keep working, that's because um, their public persona and who they are to work with are two different people. Right. Do you know what I mean? So it's, and that could be like in the housewife realm, but I think of um, Billy Eichner, who I admire greatly, um, who, you know, his Billy on the street character. <laughs> um, yeah. But, and he couldn't get hired for a long time because he was so ahead of the curve with what he was doing, but he was determined and he, you know, kept at it, kept at it and building relationships and everybody knew him. But the point is he didn't walk into meetings or on set and, you know, scream abuse and obscenities at people. His his persona and who he was to work with were two different people, enormously professional and collaborative. And we can go down the list. So I just, because I think some people who are learning only from watching TV yeah. think that like that, but that's how you behave and that these people become stars. And I'm like, because that's, that's there's a difference about making good TV on camera versus uh, making good TV off camera. A great point. And when you think about, you know, like the docu soaps that you see, like they're being an exaggerated, highly produced version of themselves. It is called reality TV, but it's far from that. It's it's heavily produced. To that point, because I wanted to say this to you earlier when we were talking about acting lessons. When a host comes to me and they say, How do I get better at hosting? I always tell them to go take improv classes. Like, yes. I think that, that is the best thing to do in tandem with hosting training. You have to be able to think on your feet and be spontaneous. So I just, I wanted to say that earlier and we kind of are sort of on that topic. So you really need to be able to improvise, especially if you're interviewing, to be fully present in the moment. And I think improv really helps with that. Oh, I totally agree. And I want to add to that. Um, I believe in taking a commercial acting class because commercial acting class is, you know, is different than um, classical acting or doing Shakespearean acting. And I had Brooke and Mary who were legendary commercial act, uh, casting directors in New York on, and they really spoke to that because first of all, I just think it creates so much more opportunity, you know, more options to work. And um, again, and you're going to learn a whole different set of skills because- well yeah, and to that point, I mean, you know, there are some companies who really want to host, but don't know where the hosting casting directors are. So they'll go to a commercial casting director, and that's who will release it. We see uh, hosting jobs come in through commercial channels a lot. So there is, and especially if you think about like commercial spokesperson, that's hosting, right? So there is a lot of that overlap. So it's a great idea to take a commercial class. I have a couple of... Um you know, friends and clients who've gotten booked in the last couple of years, highly lucrative, um, even sort of hosting some on camera, but off camera for huge brands that again, came through the commercial side. Yeah. Well, Great there's not reminder. all of you, there's not a lot of casting directors that are, you know, really known for hosting. So I, I think that some brands just out of like a lack of knowledge of where to go, they'll go to a commercial casting director. Right. And then they, and it goes through their advertising divisions yeah. and all of that makes sense, but it's just for the listeners to, again, to understand where's the opportunity, who needs to know me, it, yeah. it, you know, it, versus the, who do I need to know, which is also a really good question, but to reframe to who needs to know me, oh, these people need to know me and people need to know you. So Shannon, where can everybody find you and your many hats? Oh my goodness. Okay. So on Instagram, uh, it's the Shannon O'Dowd. Um, which sounds pretentious, but it's only because Shannon O'Dowd wasn't available. Um, and then my website is shannonodowd.com. Uh, the agency, Taylor Talent Services, is taylortalentservices.com. You can also find us on IMDb. Um, I think that's pretty much it. And are you? do you guys actively sign or, you know, what do you look for when someone approaches you? We do. We're, um, so we cap ourselves at 300 clients. Uh, we are boutique and, and it's because, you know, we, we want clients to be able to text us and call us and not go through a, you know, a bunch of assistance and, you know, we want to keep that close relationship. So we're probably at about 225 and we cap at 300. So we're always kind of looking at people and wanting to expand in both the commercial and the hosting realm. Those are our two major um, divisions. And then Blair also does some celebrity spokesperson uh, brand endorsement stuff. 
So everyone can go uh, to the Taylor Talent Services website and educate yes, themselves. We're also on Instagram. Oh, that's fantastic. And people should educate themselves and do their research, as we've discussed, before reaching out. All right. Well, thank you so much. I hope you'll come back. Oh, my gosh. I would love to. Oh, fantastic. This was and so I'm, much fun. Thank you. I know. This has been great. And I want to thank you for listening to Camera Ready and Able. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star rating. It's much appreciated, and it really helps. If you're interested in media training or help with career strategies, please shoot me a note via my website, ableintermedia.com, and be sure to download my free ebook, 12 Tips for Success on Camera.